So, we're into the second part of our, our sermon series this week. Uh, the, the sermon title, uh, the sermon series title is called Ask It, and I guess the knee-jerk reaction for anyone is, well, ask what? I want to speak to you, and we spoke about it, began to speak about it last week. I want to speak to you about the one question that is the answer for everything that you're going through right now. I want to speak to you about a question that has the ability to change your life if you decide to engage in it fully. My prayer is that as individuals in the church and as, as people in the church, as a church itself, we will begin to not just answer this question, but rather we will begin to filter every opportunity, every decision, Every invitation that we have, we begin to filter through this question. And we, at the other end of this question, end up with an answer that may change the way you deal with whatever you may be going through right now. Remember I said to you what the, the, what the question was last week? Remember I said to you about this question, your greatest regret, that one thing that defines you today? If you could take this question and you could apply this question to your greatest regret right now, I can almost guarantee you, promise you this morning, that you won't be sitting with this regret. Had you learned how to engage in this question properly? So for those of you who were here last week, can anybody tell me what the question was? You didn't see that, okay? What is the wise thing to do? It sounds like a very simple question. It sounds like a, <laughs> seriously, you're going to speak six weeks about this one question? It sounds like it, but it's far more complicated than you can even begin to imagine. And last week, you remember, we looked at the three dimensions of this question, and we essentially, when we were finished last week, we summarized it into one simple statement. This thing on. We summarized it into one simple statement. In the light of my past experiences, my current circumstances, and my future hopes and dreams, what is the wise thing to do? In the light of what's happened yesterday, in the light of what is currently going on right now, and in the light of what I know is going to happen on Monday morning, what is the wise thing that I need to do when I begin to look at this question? When we look at our past, we realize that somehow our past defined where we are today. Today, when we begin to look at our decisions that we make here and right now, we have a very good chance that it will impact tomorrow, next week, next month, next year. In fact, it will impact your future. We looked at each of these dimensions as to what is the wise thing to do within that specific event that I'm currently finding myself in. Um, and we asked the question, what is the wise thing? Not, not the right thing. Not the legal thing, not the lawful thing, but what is the wise thing for you and me to do in whatever we may be going through right now? Then at the end of last week, I gave you guys homework. I said to you, don't make any wise decisions this week. Who made any wise decisions this week? Okay, well, you don't listen to what I say, do you? <laughs> I said to you, don't make any wise decisions. But I also knew that when I said that to you, that if you begin to take this question and you apply it to whatever circumstances you may find yourself in, you will have no other option but make wise decisions in your life. And the reason I said that, is, or I knew that, was because who in his right mind is going to make a decision that will lead to tears and fears and stress and pain and hurt? None of us. We're not that stupid. So you made wise decisions. Whether you like it or not, you made some wise decisions this week. So this morning, I want to have a look at a couple of options. I want to have a look at a couple of options available to us when we begin to, um, we begin to open up this this idea of the wise thing to do. And we're going to be looking at a very, very clever man. We all know him. We all love him. He's the son of David, the other son, the real earthly son of David, Solomon. This dude wrote three books in the Old Testament. Okay, He, is the, he was the cleverest man ever to live. His name was Solomon. Uh, he wrote the book of Ecclesiastes, which is Latin for if you're over 40, read this book. Okay? All right? He wrote the book, which I call the soft porn book of the Old Testament, Song of Songs. And I call it that because early, early script, uh, scholars weren't allowed to read this book. It was the one book in the Bible that you could read anything else, but you couldn't read Song of Solomon. It was that erotic in those days. 
Um, in fact, if you were going to read it, and only a select few could get to read it, you couldn't read it alone in a room. You had to have somebody else with you, preferably with the same gender. That's how seriously they took reading this book. So it's all about love. It's, it's fantastic. It's an amazing book. And then he wrote the book of guilt. See, no matter how good you think you are, no matter how good or how right you are getting things, Proverbs will always show you that you're not getting it all that right. So when you begin to read Proverbs, it's a fantastic book. It's an amazing book. But it will highlight areas in your life where perhaps you are failing and you're not getting it right. And in the book of Proverbs, Solomon tells us essentially we have four types of people. Okay? Now, I don't want to talk about the first person. He's the wise man. We're not talking about him. He's out of this picture totally. But I do want to talk about the other three. That's why these three chairs are. You may have noticed the three chairs, but I do want to talk about them. And this message <laughs> uh, comes with a warning. It's going to be offensive to some. All right? You may get offended by what I'm going to tell you this morning. And if the reason is why that you don't come to church is because whenever the, the pastor often says things that offends you, um, the reason you don't come to church is because very often I, I, I'm offended easily. Well, you need to brace yourself because it's going to happen again today. Okay. All right. You need to brace yourself because this message can be very offensive to the three people who take up these chairs. All right. We'll get to that just a little bit later on. It will be offensive because the scripture tells us very clearly that when we do not opt to do the wise thing, we will always move towards something else. And it will never ever be a good thing. If you walk away from wisdom, you will always walk away, walk to something that can be detrimental to your health. Now, if you want to get angry with me, please don't. Okay, I'm not, I'm just the messenger. I'm giving it to you exactly what Solomon taught us in scripture. And besides, um, if you want to get upset with scripture, let me just blow that whole theory of being moved with scripture out of the water quickly. 2 Timothy 3.16 says, all scripture, that dusty book that you've got at home, that thick thing that you very rarely open, you know the book I always talk about? Okay, that's called all scripture, all right? Everything in there is God breathed. So nothing, yes, was penned by man, but it wasn't written by man. It is God breathed. God gives us the word. He gives us the scripture so that what? It will be useful for teaching, rebuking. We love that word. That's why we get offended most often. More often than not, it's because of that word. Rebuking, correcting, another one, and training in righteousness so that the servant of God may be thoroughly equipped for, and I can't read that, good works. Okay. So. Don't get offended with me this morning. I, I dare you to rather get offended by, with God. Because he's the one who wrote it, not me. I'm just going to tell you about it. All right. You need to get that. Okay. The truth is when we, we begin to walk away from wisdom, we are always walking to something that will be detrimental to your health. And many of us, many of us, some in this church right now, have no idea what we are backing up to when we avoid wisdom in our lives. We can't see it in the moment. So what I want to do this morning is I want to teach you um, about the three people who sit in these chairs. And again, it may be a little offensive to some people, but you need to, to sort of go through this. Don't, don't count the, the roof tiles when uh, you get across with me for saying something. Don't throw things and don't roll your eyes at me. Okay? It's just me telling you what the Bible says. All right? Okay, so just keep that in mind before you throw chairs. All right? The first person I want to talk about is essentially, I've got to remember where I put him. Ah, yes. Sorry. Is the simple person. I should have had Prestig or something. But anyways, the simple person is the first chair. All right? This is the first person I want to talk about. Um, okay. Now, the, the simple person essentially is not stupid. He's not dumb. She's not dumb. He's not dumb. They're not dumb. They are quite possibly naive. They are very possibly young, and they have no experience. They are clueless when it comes to life. Um, and, and, and really, at the end of the day, they lack experience totally. Taylor Swift, and please does not make me a Taylor Swift fan. Let's get this straight. In one of her songs, wrote this. She says, when you are 15 and someone tells you that you, uh, sorry, when you are 15 and someone tells you that they love you, you're going to believe them. Why? 
because you're 15, first of all, and secondly, because you have no real life experience. So when somebody comes and says to you, thank you, when somebody comes to you and says to you, oh, I love you and you're 15 years old, you're going you're gonna to go for it. Okay, cool. You're going to go for it. This is why, if you've got daughters, this is why predators can get involved with young girls so quickly. Because they look for love. They are seeking it. And when someone comes and says, I love you, they've got no backing to back them up. They've got no experience to help them through this difficulty. And this is why predators cause so much damage in the lives of especially young girls. Because they have no life experience. Parents, this may be a little bit offensive, but your 15-year-old, he or she is a simple person. To the 50, anything from 15 and under, or 21 and under, you are essentially a simple person. Not because you're stupid, not because you're uneducated, it is simply because you lack experience. You are young, you are naive, and you lack experiences. And the consequences of the decisions you make as parents will turn our hair gray sometimes. Because we can see, not through the eyes, but through our experiences, that what you're about to do is a monumentally stupid thing. And so we try to prevent you from doing that. We try to prevent you from bumping your heads. But the problem is, parents, you can't actually do that. You see, bumping your head, making mistakes, it's a part of life. It's part of the whole growing up thing that everybody has to. We went through it. Our parents let us bump our heads. Their parents let them bump their heads. And we as parents, we're going to let our kids bump their heads because essentially that is how you gain what? Experience. That's how you learn. All right? And, and a simple person has three go-to statements whenever you confront them about something that isn't a wise choice for them. The first of these is simply this. Um, nothing is going to happen. Ever heard that statement, Ferris? But no! I'm going to go, but nothing's going to happen. It's okay, don't worry about it. And the parents sit there and they go and they experience it, but listen, <laughs> how do you know? How do you guarantee me that nothing's going to happen? How do you know the future? And, and then the pastor preaching me wants to grab that by the kid by the shoulder and say, excuse me, have you got some sort of future insight that I don't have? Because if you do, let's go to the racetrack. We can make money, okay? <laughs> no. How do you know the future? How do you possibly know that nothing's going wrong? Because the parents, us, we look at our kids and we go, I know what could happen. I know what can happen. And you know how I know what can happen? It's not because I can see in tomorrow. It's because I can see into the past. I can see into what happened to me when I did what you want to do right now. Sorry, these slides have overrun a bit. The second one that they, they often throw is, but Ma, I can handle it. To which every parent in the room's hair turns gray again because we know how we handled it. And it may not have been the best possible way, and yet they say they can handle it at 15 or, or whatever the age may be. We look back at our history and we realize, but whoa, 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 we didn't handle this well at all. And, and we sort of look at our kids and say, you know what, this is the mistakes I made. How do you know that you can handle whatever you're about to do? And, and parental mode kicks in and we try to prevent our kids from, from doing some of the stupid things that our parents didn't stop us from doing. Not in personal, but it happened. We did things behind their back. Most, parents, most kids do. Okay? And your obstinate ones, they think, oh, I can handle it. I can deal with this. I can deal with whatever I am going through. And you have a right. I'll tell you right now. As a parent... You have a right to be concerned because the world is full of people right now. And you know them, and I know them, who are dealing today, 30 years, 40 years, 50 years down the road, they are dealing with the consequences of something that they did not handle well. This specific statement, I can handle it, has ruined more lives because we think we can handle it. And then we don't, we have to deal with these consequences for decades afterwards. Then the last one. But moi, you're overreacting. Remember that statement? You're overreacting. There's no young ones here, but I want to tell you if they were, I would say to them, guys, listen to me. Your parents, they overreacted because they want to ruin your social life. Okay? They want to make your life difficult. No, no, we don't want to do that. That's part of it. That's part of being a parent. We love that part. Just 
messing with the kids. We, we, we enjoy that, okay? But here's the offensive part. If you are under 21, you lack experience. It's not your fault. You're just young. Your loved ones, your parents, they are going to overreact in almost everything that you do. And you know why they want to overreact? Is because, again, we are not looking at what you want to do with our eyes. We are looking at what you want to do with our experience. And maybe that's wrong. Maybe we shouldn't do that because our experiences will be very different to our kids' experience. But that's all we have to go on. That's essentially all I have to go on when it comes to raising Connor and Jordan, is my experience. And, and if anybody in the room will tell you, I have made my fair share of mistakes. We all have. Renee, don't say anything, okay? <laughs> We overreact, essentially, because we have history. We have history, and that history is invaluable when it comes to speaking to our kids. And that history tells us that we need to help you. And, and, and the only way we can do this is to simply overreact, because we love you. <laughs> Little girls, ask your daddy to what length they will go to prevent you from dating. You'll know what I'm talking about. And I'm going to know soon what I'm, what, I'm, what I'm talking about. And if you've got older daughters, you'll know exactly what I'm talking to. What lengths your dad will go to prevent you from dating. And you know why dads go to that? It's because once, a long, long time ago, I was that little git knocking at the front door of a girl's house to take her out. So I know what was on my mind at that stage. And that parent knows what is on my mind. I pity, I pity the little tonsil who knocks on my front door to want to take Jordan out. I really pity him because it's going to be a little like a lion playing with his food. You know, um, boys, your mom is going to be like a mama bear. She's going to rip the head off the girl that breaks your heart. You know why? Because she had her heart broken by a boy. She knows the pain. She knows the hurt that you're going through. Young people, you lack experience. You have not faced consequence. And I don't care how clever you think you are. I don't, think, I don't care how worldly wise. I don't care how many friends you got on Facebook or how, <laughs> how clever your Twitter account is, you twit. It is not going to happen. You do not have experience. And I'll tell you why you do not have experience. Because you have not experienced crushing debt. So much so that you don't know when to pay or how you're going to pay the next day. You've not experienced that, so you don't fear it. You have not experienced a broken heart, a shattered heart, so much so that you cannot trust another person to love you because you have not experienced it. You have not experienced addiction because you've not experienced it. And because you've not experienced it, you do not fear it. You do not fear it. You have not gambled with your sexuality to the extent that when you don't know in the near future how you will possibly have any sort of intimacy with another person. Because you have not experienced it. And so you do not fear it. We as parents just want to love you. They're my parents. They just want to love us. They don't want us to make the mistakes. They don't want us to go down those roads. But essentially, we will choose to go down some of those roads. Before I move on, I need to say something. And it's, it's a pity there aren't more young people here, but maybe you can take this home to your, to, to your kids if, 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 if you can. I want to tell you something, something to the young people right now. You can have your youth. You can keep your youth, and you can have wisdom too. You can keep the youth that you have today, and you can have the wisdom. You can have it both ways. There are people in the church right now who wish they can go back to that stage and relive their, their late teens, early 20s. Of course, minus the Macy's and the Pacey's thing, but you, you want to relive all of that. You want to do that because there are mistakes that we would love to correct. There are people in this church who are hearing this message and saying, I wish I'd heard this when I was 15 or 16 or 17. But the young people can have the benefit of both. They can have youth and they can have wisdom. And this is what you need to tell them. The only way they can have wisdom when they're young people is to actively go out and seek it. They need to go and look for wisdom. They need to nail this thing down like a rabid dog in their lives and they need to keep it. 
Because wisdom will not come and look for you. Get what I'm telling you. Wisdom will never, ever come and look for you. You've got to go and find it, and you've got to own it. You've got to make it your own. So the young people, you can hang out with all your friends. You can wear your jeans below your bum if you want. I don't care. You can go to coffee shops. You can do all of those things, but you can also have wisdom. And with wisdom, your cluelessness, your naivety, your youth, your simplicity will not ruin and wreck your life. What is the wise thing to do? To the young people, and you can tell them this from me, do not trade what you want most for what you want now. Do you know how many people, ladies, women, men, men too, actually men too, you know how many people, young people, who could have been brilliant doctors, could have been brilliant scientists, could have been brilliant whatever, that thing in the future ruined it because they had sex and had a child at 18. Don't take what you want most for the future and ruin it by taking something that you want right now. For going for something in this moment. You can have it all. The young people can have it all today. They can have youth and they can have wisdom. Don't give up a future for what you want right now. You are going to have to do the one thing that the world doesn't want you to do. In every specific circumstance, when you're with your friends, when you're in a group of your peers, you're going to have to stop before you get to whatever they're about to do. And you're going to have to ask yourself the question, is this the wise thing for me to do? And you need to ask this question in the context of what I said earlier on this morning. In the light of my past experiences, my current circumstances, and my future hopes and dreams, what is the wise thing to do? Is what I'm about to do here and right now the clever thing for my future? You see, I think if anybody here who, who's got a regret in their life had taken that question and we had stopped and we'd asked that question of the thing that defines us today, that, 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 that ruined and wrecked our life as a young person, would we still do it? So I don't think so. But nobody ever told me to ask this question when I was a teenager. Nobody ever probably told you to ask this question when you were a teenager. Yet it's been in the Bible for thousands of years. We just haven't looked for it. We didn't seek wisdom. You see, we never went to go and look for it. The Bible stayed shut. And so now we are dealing with regrets in our lives that will, will probably be with us for the rest of our, our lives. You see, when you begin to do this, you're probably going to sound like your parents. I get it. You're probably going to sound like your parents, but I'd rather you sound like your parents than the drug dealer who wants you to make the biggest mistake of your life by trying something just once. Girls, I'd rather you sound like your parents than the little boy who wants to get into your pants. And I'm sorry, it sounds harsh and crude, but it's a fact. We need to deal with that. I'd rather you sound like your parents than that little boy who wants to do stuff to you. The second person that I want to talk about this morning is the person that Solomon calls Now, the difference between the simple and the fool is simply this. The fool is inexperienced. Sorry, the, the, the simple is inexperienced. The fool knows the difference between right and wrong, but doesn't care. The difference between the simple is that the simple just don't know. They're inexperienced. The fool knows the difference between right and wrong, but he or she does not care. Does not care. The fool will read the packaging of something and he will still do what that package he tells him not to do because he does not care. He knows it's dangerous, he knows it's stupid, but he will still go and he will still do it because he doesn't care. When everybody else is bailing out of something, walking away from something, the fool will continue to push the agenda. The fool will continue to get involved with this because he doesn't care. Care. They have all the proof in the world that this thing is going to be detrimental to them, yet they will continue to do it. And when you confront somebody like this, when you speak to somebody, they're not going to listen to you. You know why they're not going to listen to you? Because they know the answer already. 
They understand the answer very clearly, but they don't care. Besides, it's none of your business. But out. Leave me alone. And this is where it can get a little bit offensive for people who find themselves in this chair. Solomon has a name for it. He calls them fools. I know some of you in the church, maybe you're sitting here this morning and you're connecting with what I'm saying to you to yourself, but you say, I'm not going to listen to him. I'm going to do what I want to do. I don't care. I'm going to follow through with what I have to do. And this is what Solomon says about it. Solomon was incredibly clever. You need to understand that he was around thousands of years ago. Now, just one quick question. Um, who of you will be spoken about and read about in a thousand years? None of us. Yet thousands of years down the road, Solomon is still being referred to as the wisest man. His readings are still relevant to the world as we understand it today. And this is exactly what Solomon has to say about the fool. Proverbs 26, 11 says, As a dog returns to its vomit, so fools repeat their folly. Now close your eyes and picture that, just for a moment. Okay. <laughs> okay, you got that picture? Keep it in mind. As dogs return to its vomit, so fools will repeat their folly. Okay? The fools will always do the same thing again. The fool understands the outcome of what he is about to do or has done, and he will do it Again, they will return to their vomit. I'm sorry if it's offensive, but I've got the backing of Scripture to help me with this. A fool will always do the same thing again. Solomon 10.23, Proverbs 10.23 says this. He says, a fool finds pleasure in wicked schemes. A fool will find pleasure in wicked schemes. Do you have any idea where if you continue doing what you're doing right now, where it's going to go? Yeah, I know, but it's fun. Why do you keep dating the same sort of person? I don't know, it's fun. Do you have any idea that if you put your money into this thing, you know what's going to happen? Yeah, I know, but you know what? It's got a good return, and besides, I'm having fun. A fool will have fun in his wicked schemes. A fool will always have fun in what he is doing. And we know people like this. We know people who will do this sort of thing. Remember I said to you last week, I said you people in glass houses shouldn't walk around naked. You remember that statement I made? The other one, people in glass houses shouldn't throw stones because we can sit in the church and think, well, I know somebody like that. Yeah, I know somebody who's doing that. But we don't apply the teaching to ourselves because maybe somewhere along the line, we are doing the same thing to ourselves. If you have an area in your life where you're doing the thing that is so absolutely, absolutely wrong, and you keep doing it anyway, guess what? You're a fool. You are a fool. So Solomon calls you a fool, and I will call you a fool, because you're doing something that you know eventually is going to hurt you. If you have a DUI, for those of you who don't know what that is, driving under the influence, and you climb behind a car's wheel drunk, you are a fool. All right? If the doctor says to you that your entire family is predisposed to cancer, but you're smoking two packs a day, you are a fool. You know, some of you may say to me, but I know this is bro, really offensive and I'm not going to come back to this church. You'll come back to this church when you experience the cure for your foolishness. If you cannot buy food for your family and you have to lend money every month to get by, but come the 25th, you're sitting in the casino and you're spending your whole paycheck on a machine, then you are a fool. And so we come to the conclusion that the cure for the simple and the cure for the fool, two very different cures. When it comes to the simple person, the cure is what? Time. Time. That's all it is. The simple will get cured by experience, by time. The fool, however, will always be cured by tragedy. The fool will always be cured by tragedy. If you get behind the wheel of the car drunk, time and time again, you are eventually going to be arrested, or even worse, you may even kill somebody. Tragedy. The fool, if you smoke, sorry, if you smoke cigarettes... And in spite of being, being, being um, told by the doctors that your family is predisposed to it, you keep smoking cigarettes, eventually you will end up back in church in a big long box in the front here. Unfortunately for the fool, the cure is always going to be tragedy. 
I think I had a okay. will be tragedy. So as I end off the second person, the fool, and we didn't have too much time to speak on that, I need to say to you that for the fool, you may not want to change. Besides, you may not even want to listen to what I have to say to you right now because it's not really any of my business. But I want to ask you a question. If you think that you're taking up the seat, how often have you said to yourself, but you know what? What I'm doing isn't harming anybody else except me. The fool will always say, well, it isn't harming anybody else except me. And I want to tell you what Solomon has to say about this. Proverbs 13 verse 20 says, Walk with the wise. For the companion of fools will suffer harm. Where did I put that? I think I've lost my place here. Walk with the wise and become wise. For the companion of fools will suffer harm. Who's the companion of fools? Husbands, wives, employees, children. Anybody who is involved with a fool right now will eventually suffer harm. The Bible tells us, and the tragedy uh, of a fool is that he doesn't just harm himself. He harms somebody else, or even worse, everybody else around him. Eventually, we go back to my analogies. Eventually, if you do climb in a car, you will kill somebody if you were drunk. Okay? If you die from lung cancer after being warned that you are predisposed to it, you know what may happen down the road, a year, 10 years? Your kids, your spouse may die of secondary lung cancer. If your gambling gets out of hand, you may lose your wife, your home, your husband, your kids, everything else. You may lose all of that. Eventually, the fool, what they are doing with themselves, will spill over into other people's lives. Will spill over into the lives of other people, and it will do harm to them. And I'll tell you why. It's because the fool is blinded by his or her own selfishness. It's all about me. It's all about what I can get out of it. I don't care what anybody else feels. I don't care what harm I do to anybody else. In fact, I don't think I'm doing any harm to anybody else. So it's a case of, it's about me. Young people... This is why your parents will freak out at some of your friends. I freak out at some of your friends, and I've seen them, okay? But this is why people freak out at your friends. Your parents freak out because they know this piece of scripture. The companion of fools will suffer harm. They know that if you spend enough time with a specific person, and this person isn't good for you, you are going to suffer harm. I don't care how clever you, they, they think they are. I don't care how bright these kids are. They may be straight A students. But spend enough time with a fool and you will suffer harm. The Bible teaches us. The Bible tells us this. If the fool doesn't take care of his body, he's not going to be worried about yours. If the fool is willing to shove chemicals into their system, he's not going to try and stop you from it. He's going to be, drag you with him. If the fool will sleep with anything that moves... He's not going to try and prevent you from doing it. He's going to drag you with him. They don't care about their futures. The fools don't care about their futures. And if they don't care about their futures, they are not going to care about yours. It's biblical. It's written. It's in the word of God. And God's word doesn't make a mistake. The last person I want to speak about this morning is this guy. Of all of them, he's the most dangerous. Out of all of them, this guy is the most dangerous. A mocker, or as the Bible calls them, a scoffer, is simply a fool on steroids. They know the difference between right and wrong. They know the difference between right and wrong. And they don't care, first of all. But they will always mock and scoff those who are trying to do the right thing. A mocker is going to be critical always. He's going to be condescending. If you don't know what that means, it's when people speak down to you. Okay. Condescending. You didn't get that. Okay, cool. Um, you will always be off balance. Even when you think you're in balance with a person like that, he's not going to allow you to stay there. He will kick the chair out from underneath you, and when you're down, he will mock you. The mocker is not somebody you're going to find in a church is very easy. You know why? Because you guys won't invite him here. You don't want to put me through that. You don't want to put your friends through, so you don't invite him to church. Because you know that the minute you tell him you're a Christian, he's going to nail your faith. He's going to climb into your character. He's going he's to break you down and all your happy, clappy, uh, hand-raising friends. He's going to break him down because that's what he or she does. They mock. A mocker 
is a person who will always control any conversation. They will want to be in control because they can take it where they want to go. They always think they're the cleverest people in the room, but they're not actually the cleverest people in the room. Okay. If you work for someone like this, you're probably a very miserable person. If you're married to someone like this, then you're probably not in a happy marriage right now. Because the mocker will always try to break you down. They will always try to destroy you at the best possible way that they can. If you are a mocker and you're sitting in the church, well, welcome. You may be very offended by what I've said to you this morning. And I know that you're sitting there right now thinking, oh, wait till I get Andre in a corner. I'm going to just give him a piece of my mind. I'm going to be... I know what you're thinking. I get it. If you're a person that's connected to a mocker, maybe you're married to someone, you work for someone like that, maybe you're angry with me this morning because I've shone a light on something that's going on in your life. And you maybe not like it. And again, please don't throw stuff at me. I'm just saying the stuff that I got from the Bible. I didn't suck this out of my thumb. It all comes from Scripture. Solomon, Psalm 9, verse 7, uh, so, so, uh, sorry, Proverbs 9, verse 7 to 8 says this. Whoever corrects a mocker invites insults. Whoever rebukes the wicked incurs abuse. Do not rebuke the mocker or they will hate you. We all perhaps know someone like this. And you know for a fact that you can't debate with this person. You can't talk to this person. You can't try and help this person. You can't begin to correct this person. Because if you open yourself up to doing this and you become vulnerable for the, they go straight for the jugular. And they will do the most damage that they possibly can do to you in the shortest period of time. Besides, the fact is if you think they didn't like you before you tried any of this, when you do this, they're going to hate you. They're going to hate you and they will go out of their way to make your life even more miserable. Because that's what they do. As we begin to close, I just want to summarize the guys. If you correct the simple, they're not going to get you. Okay? If you correct the fool, they're going to ignore you. All right? If you correct the mocker, he's going to end up or she's going to end up hating you. But if you correct the wise, they will Thank you. You know I know this? It's because the wise is the person who listens. Is the person who learns. The wise is the person that doesn't allow their self-esteem or their abilities to drive their relationships. It is the person who is open to any sort of advice, good advice, that may come their way. If that wise person is a Christian, well, guess what? The wise will thank you because they know that through doing this, they will draw closer to their heavenly Father. Here's the thing. We have the three chairs. Somewhere in the life of each of these people, they are going to get to a place where they desperately, desperately need wisdom. They are going to reach a space in their life somewhere along the line where they realize that what's going on it's not working. And they are going to need wisdom. They are going to need to find wisdom. I would discard this one to a large degree. Because this is age. This is experience. This is uh, young. These two are what I'm talking to more about. They're going to reach a stage where they need to find wisdom. And you know what's going to happen? They're not going to get it. They're not going to get it because they may be faced with it as they sit on their chair and they're not going to recognize it. People will come with all kinds of the best possible, but they'll give them the best possible solution ever to what they're going through, and they will not recognize it. You know why? Because they've sat in these chairs for too long. They've sat in these chairs for way, way too long. Solomon says that it can be so hopeless, their situation can be so hopeless that they cannot hear wisdom. You can send them all kinds of messages, mails, texts. You can talk to them. They're not going to hear it. So what Solomon does in Proverbs 1 is he takes the whole idea of wisdom and he personifies it into the form of a woman which is dangerous to do, but, okay, he personifies it into the form of a woman. Okay, and I'm sorry, guys, but it wasn't me, it was him. Besides, he can't be all that bright. He had 700 wives and concubines, so I don't know why you want to do that to yourself, but he wrote this. He personifies wisdom into the form of a woman. This is what I want to just read to you and go through quickly as we close off. Proverbs 1, 20 to 21 says this. Out, of the op out in the open, wisdom calls aloud. Okay, get this statement. Wisdom isn't hiding under a rock. 
Okay? It's not in a bookshelf. It may be, but it's not necessarily in a bookshelf. Just switch this off me there, please. Sorry, you uh, It may be on a bookshelf. Wisdom isn't hiding away. It's out there. There are people who give away wisdom every day. That's why you go to school for 12 years. That's why you go to varsity for 7 years. There are people who give away wisdom. Solomon says the woman is out there. She's out there in the open. And she, uh, uh, sorry, out in the open. Wisdom calls aloud. It's being spoken to our lives the whole time. She raises her voice in the public square. It's not hidden. It's everywhere. On top of the wall, she cries out. At the city gate, she makes her speech. In other words, get what I'm telling you right now. You can't hide wisdom. It's available to each and every one of us. We just need to open our eyes and look for it. Verse 22, Solomon writes this, How long will you, sorry, how long will you who are simple love your simple ways? How long will the mockers delight in mockery and fools hate knowledge? He speaks to the young, he speaks to the fool, and he speaks to the mocker. He says, how long will you who are simple love your simple ways? How long will mockers delight in mockery and fools hate knowledge? In other words, Guys, how long are you going to sit in these chairs? How long are you going to choose to be seated in these chairs? To the, to the young, to the, to, 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 the, to the simple, how long are you going to sit there? To the mocker, how long are you going to sit in this chair and criticize everybody? To the fool, how long are you going to sit there and ignore good advice that is given to you? And Solomon tells us that wisdom Response. In this proverb, wisdom responds. And this is what wisdom has to say. Say, repent at my rebuke. Then I will pour out my thoughts to you. I will make known to you my teachings. Wisdom says that if you hear what I have to say, if you hear what I'm telling you right now, and you repent of your ways, you can grow. You can get out of these chairs, and you can become the wise man. Solomon continues, 24 to 25. But since you refuse to listen, let me read it from here. Since you refuse to listen when I call, and no one pays attention when I stretch out my hand, since you disregard all my advice and do not accept my rebuke, I in turn will laugh when disaster strikes you. I will mock when calamity overtakes you, when calamity overtakes you like a storm, when disaster sweeps over you like a whirlwind, when distress and trouble overwhelm you. What Solomon was saying, and this is a warning that we can to all the people who take up these chairs right now, the Lord wants to pour wisdom out over every one of us. He's waiting to pour his wisdom out over every single one of us. But if we ignore him, if we do not engage in the wisdom that God has for us, guess what? Where did I see it there? I, in turn, will laugh when disaster strikes you. I will mock when calamity overtakes you. When calamity overtakes you like a storm. If you do not listen to wisdom, wisdom is going to laugh at you when everything begins to fall apart around you. Why? It's because you didn't hear what she had to say. I want to tell you something, and this is a bit of a personal one, this. But you know what the most difficult job, or part of my job is? And I've only had the opportunity to do it twice. But you know what the most difficult part of my job is? Is when somebody gets out of these chairs, and they phone me and they say, Listen, Andre, I want to talk to you. Come, let's meet. And they sit down and they say to me, I'm tired of being this. I want to change my life. I've lived too long in one of these chairs and I want to become a, a better person. And I have to turn around and say, look, I'm sorry, but what you want, you cannot have. What you are asking me to help you with today, you cannot have. Now, let me just be very, very clear before you all think that God is, can't do anything in this situ situation. You can never, ever, ever spend enough time in these chairs for God not to love you. You could never ever spend so much time in these chairs that God will reject you or turn his, his back on you. What this piece of scripture simply means is that I have these people who come to me and say, you know what, I want to change. I don't want to be the mocker. I don't want to be the fool. Again, this one is a little bit on, on, on the left fringe, but I don't want to be these. But you know what I do want, Andre? I want my marriage restored. And I want my finances restored. And I want my career back on track. And I want to be able to talk to my kids again. And I want to talk to my grandchildren. And you know what that breaks my heart is when I turn and I say, to you, you know what? There's a very, very real chance that you will not get those things. 
It destroys people when I tell them that. And I'll tell you why I say that to them, because it's not going to happen. Since, Proverbs 1, 30 to 31, since they would not accept my advice. In other words, if you didn't listen to what wisdom was telling you, and you spurned its rebuke, my rebuke, they will eat the fruit of their ways and be filled with the fruit of their schemes. <laughs> 